now we're going to go back to Elliot and Sean for the, the reveal. <laughs> so last week I said we we're going to have a special announcement. Um, Who doesn't know the announcement? Okay. So um, today, this morning, we launched all of our 2013 trip data. Um, and we're making it available publicly at divibikes.com uh, slash data challenge. And we turn it into a contest and want to we know that a lot of you, a lot of people out there, will just want to tinker with the data themselves. They would do it anyway, but we thought we'd make it fun, um, make a contest out of it, reward prizes for the most beautiful, uh, what are the categories again? The best overall, the most beautiful, most comprehensive, most insightful, most creative. Um, those are sort of the things that we're looking for. Um, and basically, all of the trip data you'll download an Excel file. It'll include, as listed here. The start date and time, the end date and time, uh, the bike ID, actually that's not on there, start station, end station, what rider type they are. So we have members, people who pay that $75 for membership, and also people who just get a 24 hour pass at the station. And if they are a member, we also include their year of birth and their gender. Although the year of birth, uh, in some cases, is off. I think there are reports that one person is 107 years old. Um, <laughs> I guess it was it's self-reported your birth. It's so. self-reported, yeah. So I think it typed in 1906. Did you see this? This was made already today at like noon or two o'clock. I did see that. Yeah. This is already there have been two uh, two people ready to go, starting already today, uh, <laughs> using the data. Um, and so this one shows the age. Yeah, the average age is 34. And then this one shows the gender distribution. Hello. Oh, yeah. So this is um, not totally surprising. We see that in other cities with bike share that is used heavily male. Uh, here's another gender. So that's that's daily right <laughs> for members. Uh, so gender. so yeah. In terms of trips, the trips at least in 2013 were 80 percent male and 20 percent female. The members themselves are actually 69% male and 31% female. Uh, but you know, this is the early days of bike share and we hope to keep in this out. So basically you come here, download the data. Um, basically what we're looking for are infographics, animations, and interactive websites, whatever people are interested in exploring, uh, whatever questions that you have that you want to um, answer. Here's some examples from Hubway, which is our sister bike share in Boston. They did this last year. Here's one example of, I think this was a winner for the most extensive narrative. And you can see there's a lot going on there. But, uh, you know, we're looking at things like this, or even simple things, maybe just one specific question you want to answer and just one map that you uh, create. The way you think about these products is the products could either be things that help people understand the system. That was a good example of that one. But things, I'm saying things, so it could be an app, it could be a visualization, it could be a poem, whatever. Uh, things that help these guys run the system better, and we've already seen a few examples of that. So if any of you are good at predictions, and you can do, then that would be helpful. Or also things that help users use the system. Right? So those are three buckets you can kind of use to, to think about this. Or, or things that are just really cool. What things are really cool? There was an animation of London uh, Park the Cycle Hire that yeah. I saw probably six months or a year ago. It's just really cool to, it, to watch all the trips. and I mean, you literally, it's mesmerizing. It's like a spirograph, watching it kind of float. Mm -hmm. So things like that that are just cool. That's, that's also something we're interested in. So there's uh, 759,000 individual trips. They're all anonymized. Um, so there's a lot to play with. So it's everything from uh, June 28th to December 31st. Um, did you want to point out something about the like the Boston Latin School students? Or no, these school? were just these okay. nothing just in particular. Just yeah. examples of what people did um, in other systems, just to give sort of a sense of you know what you might do. So why is this data a big deal, and how is it different from from the other data? I'm glad you asked. And I can give you your explanation. So remember this, this this kind of heartbeat data. So for every station, we have a row in a spreadsheet, and each row each row is a station, and it tells you the number of bikes. 
and that, that whole spreadsheet updates every minute. That's what this stuff is. What this is is basically a spreadsheet where you're going to have the each row is a trip from A to B, and so uh, this column is going to be A station, this column is going to be B station, it's going to tell you how long it took. So basically the same data as powering Divi Brags. Um, so think about this bike takes off, and now it's riding. It's my awesome bike. <laughs> it's a pretty good bike, right? Uh, it's writing, so when this happens a minute later, this all of a sudden goes down to zero. Uh, but here it starts to register the trip. So it's like, oh, it started A, and then eventually time passes and it gets to B. This is, this, is a, this is a trip right here, and then this is an independent station, which all of a sudden that next minute was now a one out of three. So the reason this is so powerful is that it lets us understand the kind of network properties of the system, whereas before we just all we saw is like blindly how many bikes were at each station at any given time. We didn't understand flow, and it's it's called the bike share network for for, nothing, for for a reason, right? So flow is really important. Um, so that's kind of how these things are, are different. <coughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about the. Hi, by the way. Um, uh, so you said the chips are anonymous, or the the riders are anonymous, but can you see, say, that like a fifty year old man started here at this station A and station B? Is that work that way? Yeah. So. It's, it's just anonymous in the sense that uh, you, you can't tell who the person is, but if, if it's a right. member trip, say you took a trip, um, you know, it's a, a male who's X age took it from this station to that station, and it's all in one line. So each trip is a single trip. So this is you want to pull it up, actually? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I just want to small so then, uh, do you have the data in there as to when that person became a member? So you could look at, like, in the trajectory of their membership when they were most active? Yeah, so that's one piece that's missing is we, we don't include that. And actually, you can't track an individual member. Um, you can't be like, oh, member 2947 took this many trips. It's all just trips and who the person is, but not. As a unit, unit okay. identifier. Right? You can just There's probably like it. a tech, or like how would you describe it? You know, that's it. Yeah. Unit identifier. Yeah. You might be able to assume if the same person, if the same age rider starts at the same station, yeah, at the same time every day and ends at the same station at the same time. Yeah. So only that, that, that 106 year old right? There's a trying to reverse engineer this. Because the theory of giving us this much information is that it's okay to give us age and, and gender because we can't personally identify. Who's writing? But if you figure out a way to, to do it, you should tell them. So that could be a project in itself, which is figuring out how private is the state about. To me, it seems pretty private, but that, that could be a project. In Boston, they did that, where they gave, I think, they gave like three years worth of data to MIT students and software computers and using this. Um, and Minneapolis had that issue as well. They released a little too much data. Oh, really? Yeah. And in, in Boston, they weren't able to determine who it was. <laughs> Well, that's MIT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do they know? Um, here's uh, one example of taking the trip data. So you select a state. This is in Washington, D.C. You select a station. So this one's near uh, Reagan National Airport. And, and it draws these lines. And the thickness of the line denotes the popularity of that specific trip. So between station at 18 needs, most trips end up at 12th and Hayes or South Georgetown on the Navy Drive. And I know we all know exactly where those are. <laughs> um, so now with this data that Divi has just released, you could build the same, or you could build something completely different. And so that's what the, the hack pad that it started is a lot of examples of people in New York. Well, actually not New York, because New York has not released this data. But Washington, D.C., <laughs> Boston, and Minneapolis have created and then gave your, made this chart, and another person made this chart. So in three hours or whatever, people are already champing at the bit to, to see what they can make with this data. Yeah, I was actually, I was surprised by how much people are still mining in December. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's also, like, the variability is really intense. And 
So I think this variability is um, since these are all member trips, right? Yeah. So members right. typically take off take a lot of their trips during the weekdays when right. they're commuting, and then the weekends. Is. That's right. Exactly. But but like female is not as variable. Like, so hold on. What, what are we looking at here? Are these the number of trips per day? Well, per, per day. Yeah. So this is a week right here, and then like kind of goes up and then goes down. Yeah. The other thing to consider is on the form that you submit your gender, male is listed first, female second. And it's also, I was trying to check in my own profile, male is, like, it's shown first. So chances are, like, I mean, it's possible somebody just puts the first thing they see. Yeah. I mean, yeah, someone who makes a lot of web forms will oftentimes <laughs> just yeah. check the first thing. <clears throat> so that's something that could be during the data yeah. in some way. It was uh, mentioned earlier that you said like 10 or 11 people or no more have been like scraping like minutes. Yes. Is that, is anybody like sharing it? I mean, is that so like yes, Ian Dees, who's not here, he has it. Um, okay. And so we downloaded it, it's like 175 megabytes. Um, okay, so, so here it is. Oh, so now, well, so he, he it's just, it takes a while for him to put it together. Uh, and so the first one is 175 megs, and it unzips to two gigs. One text, or no, actually, it's like thousands of text files, one for every station for every day, I think. Um, so 300 times the number of days it lasts. Um, and then he just issued a new one today in anticipation of this uh, challenge. Um, um, by sharing data.hackpad.com. Yeah. And then it's called Chicago Data and Experiences. Um, you'll find, so I, I created this website like six months ago, and I put every single link that I can possibly find about bike share data around the world. Um, okay, so now we got questions and answers at that. Yeah, go for it. Yes. That's something actually that we have come up with some metrics for and gets reported on a, just on a monthly basis by Divi to the city. It's one of our reporting things to look at greenhouse gas emissions avoided and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what's that? Calories burned. And calories burned, right. Um, but the health department, as far as we know, the health department hasn't, well, the health department has not requested that data from me. Um, so I don't think they're looking at it right now. Are there GIS in it? No, I mean, no one has requested the data from me at this point. We'd certainly share it with them. Yeah. We'd love to share it, but. Has it been data? Uh, no. No. Um, we, you know, we talked about that. We actually uh, worked with, or we originally had a discussion with uh, some researcher, a researcher who used to be Arizona State, I think, and is now at Notre Dame. And we looked at that. The problem was um, the sensor that they wanted to install needed external power. Mm -hmm. And our stations are modular and so solar powered. We don't have any extra power to give them. And we weren't running infrastructure to them because they're all cellular and solar. Um, so we weren't able to do that ultimately. So we actually have a, a hardware designer here, Rob, uh, and partner. They have developed such a device that would track a lot of different things about the sure, climate. Humidity, <coughs> air quality, varying speed. Awesome. Well, you know how to get hold of us. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, what's the deadline? Deadline is March 11th. Good month. Yeah. How frequently are you planning to update the uh, usage data? It's a good question. Um, we haven't decided yet. 
other systems, sometimes they're quarterly, but you know, whatever I guess we're open to feedback in terms of how often you want to see it. How much time does it take to package it together? Uh, not too much time at all. Yeah, probably as often. We can't do it every day, but we would. We do it every month. every yeah. month or quarter. We probably would be the fastest. It's a sample, right? Sample, no. It's all the Yeah. 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 All the yeah. yeah. <laughs> actually, if you want really good predictions, you should make. Uh, the trips available in real time. So the second someone takes out a bike, you yeah. should be able to know. Because what that I'll tell you is, um, and, and if for certain people, <coughs> provided the, the person, then you could come up with a really fancy algorithm that would say, oh, not only you know do these flows tend to happen from this time to this station, this station where it's this hot, but so and so is riding, which means that they're likely to go there, and so you can get really good predictions. That way. I mean, that's a pretty good ways down the road, but that's one reason you might want to do it in real time. I just had a general question about integrating Divi bike share stations with public transit stops. So, for instance, if you wanted to take a trip on a bus and then get on Divi, how you could have an app that could tell you how to get from point A to point B using that transportation option? Yeah. So, one of my goals is to have this all integrated with Google. Um, I mean, be anyone, but a lot of people use Google Maps. And that's sort of, I think, the sign that like, bike share is actually a legitimate form of transit is that it's mainstream in that way. That's 10% kind of opinion. But it's one of the things that I'd like to see happen. Uh, they haven't done it for any other city yet, but we are chatting with them and seeing, you know, they have other problems going on, but ideally we'd like to do that. And I'm, so I'm, Another hat I wear is travel demand management, and one of the things I want to do is actually an app that would do that, integrate all <coughs> of the transit options into the same place, where you can also set a profile as to what your preferences are in safety, speed of travel, costs, and all those things, sliders or however you want to do it. But And then you could basically use your phone, geolocate, and say, I want to get here, but in your direct, and get the, all your options in your priority <coughs> order. And I, no one's created that yet, but that's kind of that's my dream, and that's I may have some money to throw at it at some point this year. But that's I think Open Plans has made something similar to that. At least with the there are pieces of it. Open Gen Planner has yeah. all basically all the raw pieces you want to be able to look at. Um, I mean, we actually tried to set up a Winter Planner instance here for Chicago, but they kind of lost momentum on it because you can't be Google, right? So yeah. it's like it's hard to it's hard to be that big. Like that. So, I mean, what makes what makes sense to me is, uh, I mean, getting all the train data in the Google Maps was an initiative that was started by, I believe, the Portland TriMet in Portland, yeah. Oregon, to get to develop the standard uh, GTFS, they call it, so the Google Transit Beam standard. Uh, and then eventually, everybody sort of decided to release all their data. If you want your, if you want, it was pretty much like Google said, put your data in this format. We'll suck it up and we'll add it to our Google Maps. And all of a sudden, all these other you know transit authorities start adding the data. So it seems like since Alta and Divi are sort of in this space as a big player, you guys could lead the way in developing the standards, and and that would be a way to pass it over. Yeah, I think the I'm from Portland. The Portland tool actually has um, integration with your own personal bicycle. So like, we don't have bikes yet in Portland, but. Um, but I did have one more question, if I may. Um, so in terms of your demographic data. I'm a member of Divi, but I don't think you asked any questions with regard to race or household income. Uh, do you ask those questions of your membership writers? And um, if not, would you consider requesting that information? And if you did, would you release it? Uh, so we don't currently. We probably wouldn't add it to the form just because people abandon forms and more questions are asked. But we. Do do an <coughs> annual survey, which we actually just completed a couple weeks ago, and that was included in that. Uh, we haven't published the results of that yet, but I think it's we will be soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it did. It, it requested all that. It, it also did some interesting things, finding about because we were interested. Divi's interested in some different pricing and maybe options to be able to offer more options. So maybe a monthly membership where you pay a certain amount, five or ten dollars a month for a membership. <coughs> um, and we at the city were really interested in 
why do you take your bike? You know, why do you take? Why do you ride where you ride? Either on Divi or your own personal bike. What type of infrastructure would actually compel you to ride more? Those sorts of things. So we combined our efforts and put a survey out to all the Divi members. Went out to about 9,000 uh, members three weeks ago, two weeks yeah. ago. Um, and so we're we we're just wading through that data right now, but we got some really good data, and it included those questions. How many members do you have? Uh, Twelve thousand. Okay, so nine thousand responded. Nine thousand received it because we only sent it to people who had actually given us some trips. But there are some people who had first so we five or more. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we got about twenty four hundred responses. So pretty good response, response rate for us. Another way to estimate it is you guys have the home addresses of all the numbers. So you can look at census data for the nearby census tract. It can give you at least a rough sense of the point. Yeah. Can you talk more about what you plan on pricing on and what you've done at this point as far as what it costs to make the trade? Um, yeah, so the pricing is $75 per year, $7 for our pass. And that pricing was basically based on what other bike share do. We sort of use that as the model. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of room to become more sophisticated. It's a, and it's actually, so it's so unsophisticated that it's set in the contract. So okay. the contract with the city to Alta says these are the prices you're going to charge. Yeah. And, but it also allows for flexibility and approval on the city's part and working together to come up with a different pricing model um, if, if we want to. So that's what they're be possible. Um, it could be. I think at this point it's not with the software that we currently operate the system on. I don't think we could dynamically price, but we could potentially. Yeah. For this year, really we're not we don't have plans to increase prices or really change it considerably, but like Sean said, we want to offer the best options. So for example, right now, if you remember, you get the first 30 minutes of your trip included in your membership. Some people say, you know, I want that extended 45 or 60 minutes. So we could possibly see a, a world in which you pay $75 like now for 30 minutes of every trip free, um, and maybe you pay, you know, 90 or 95 dollars for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so that was what was in the survey. Yes, Steve, Steve wrote about this. Um, you know, some people have said that they're actually willing to pay, you know, 20 dollars more a year to have that peace of mind or to be able to travel a little bit further. Or conversely, as Stephen knows, the, the holy grail in bike share is the unbanked, people who don't have bank accounts. And no one that in, no one nationally or internationally has figured out how to do that. But one way is to have pricing models that actually provide some flexibility where people who can't maybe afford to do first of all, there's do people have a credit or debit card? We recognize that's an issue. We're working on that. There's community partnerships and other ideas that we can do. Um, to kind of take on the main reason for that is is liability. The bike costs twelve hundred dollars to replace, and it does actually cost us twelve hundred dollars to replace the bike. We're not price gouging; that is what it costs um, to get a new bike. But to take on that liability, so we're looking at that, but also offering more flexible <coughs> models for people who can't afford seventy-five dollars all at once is something we're also interested in. They said there's thirty minutes. Is included in every trip for members. Um, and he said, and the, I took the survey, and probably several people here also took the survey, and one of the choices was like, would you pay a different price to get 45 minutes? And so, one thing that's interesting about Rin's data here is that if you look at the, uh, the average distance, and it's only 1.7 miles, mm -hmm. which, and then if you look at the average duration, it's, well, I think the average was broken down into minutes and seconds, but it's probably somewhere around like, 15 minutes. Yeah. And that is basically nationally congruent. Most people's trips are less than two miles um, by bike, by car, by walking, by yeah. any mode. Um, so like I was like, no, I don't want 45 minutes. I don't care if it's costs you know, one dollar extra a month. I just do not need it ever. Yeah. And it really plays out that way in people's behavior. Or the fresh supply at the level we have here. There's a there's definitely enough poor supply of these people to make some money to get a safe some of them charging. And then there's I mentioned dock surfing, so you just put a bike in, right, right. wait like five seconds and take it the same way. That would be crazy. Like I love the find a user ID just so we can kind of start trying to track the dock surfing. Actually, how popular it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows about it? These ones bike ID on the computer, right? 
Um, so bike ID you said was in this it is your data. Yeah. So you can keep track of bike so through this system. So that's just a bike from local Yeah, you probably do a for how long the bike stays there. The formula that says oh, it isn't here. Right? Okay. <laughs> the bike is returned to a station and taken out. <laughs> That'll be a fun one. Like, a life of being alive on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it goes around. I mean, who doesn't ask a question? Yeah, I, real quick, it's not really about city bikes exactly, but like, as a bicycle rider in the city for a long time, I've seen city come along in, in other cities. Like, in having had a really bad accident myself, um, the thing that concerns me is like, well, there's no like helmet station, you know. Um, yeah. And I see a lot of people like Steve who have their own helmets and bring that with. I'm wondering like, with the increased number of people on bikes in the street and so on, how you seeing how how what are your thoughts about them? on helmets or on like safety gear? I guess and then, has that increased? Uh, have you seen any kind of increase in injuries because people won't have bikes? Or so we. We can only track with the incidents that are reported to us, yeah. and to date, I think eight, seven or eight accidents have been reported to us. Crashes. I'm sorry, crashes. <laughs> yes, seven or eight crashes. Crashes. And one that actually the person had to seek medical treatment. So when you think of, yeah, you know, seven hundred fifty thousand trips. I don't. Eight hundred thousand trips. So. 800,000 trips. That's point of oh, 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 You know, so bike share riders. Experience fewer crashes and injuries as of as part of the whole of all places. Which is not to say that helmets don't matter. Yeah. Um, it's they're not legally required in Chicago, but or in Illinois. Motorcyclists uh, don't need to wear helmets in Illinois, which is debate <laughs> <laughs> whether or not that's a smart thing to do. But the the issue is there just isn't the technology hasn't really been developed. Yeah. Although we are talking to uh, a provider. Yeah, so we, we, Ellie and I, we've been working on this actually over the last couple of weeks. We um, talked to, there's a there's a prototype in Boston called Helmet Hub, which, which is actually, it was developed by MIT students. It's a helmet vending machine. Uh, you can either sell or rent them, so that that's one option we're looking at. We have a conversation Thursday, I think, with a large uh, company that's everywhere to sell low-cost helmets to the public, or at least in areas where um, there's a higher concentration of tourists and folks who may not be like Stephen. I keep, I have, helm, I have a helmet at home, and I have a helmet in my office, so I always have a helmet. Although Elliot and I, we walked over here ultimately, but we talked about being over here and not wearing helmets. <laughs> Everyone does it occasionally. We don't recommend it. We strongly recommend you wear a helmet. Although there are studies, too, that show that people, even if they don't wear helmets, if they're more active biking, they are actually live longer and have a healthier lifestyle. So even without the helmet, even if you get in a crash, it's a crash and you're likely to get injured. But longevity and other health statistics are actually better like either with or without it. Yeah. The other issue is that to the extent that Maybe because it makes biking so easy, has led to more bike riders. It means each bike rider is on average safer. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what, um, I guess what is in terms of keeping this system up and running and managed? What's your biggest headache? Right? Is it is it bike? Is it stockouts on bikes at high volume stations? Is it? So at the moment, as in today, there. Are very few issues. What happens in the summer, though, when right. everyone starts using? It? Um, I, 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 at the yeah. moment, in the big, in the big, in the big yeah. yeah. The hardest thing is um, rush hour. So everybody converging downtown at the same time. Everybody's leaving at the same time. Uh, there's only so much we can do. We can have more docks. We can have more vans on town. But um, we have a lot of issues with, with isolated um, stations outside of those major downtown stations that have regular stockout problems. Outside of downtown, some, sometimes along the blue line, um, <laughs> along the Lake Montreal, some of the ones at the harbors, yeah. um, especially but, on weekends in the summer, like if it's a beautiful day, uh, people will have to form a line to wait for a bike to be returned or just 
which leaves the kiosks, things like that. So uh, I would say, you know, during the weekdays it's rush hour, and during the weekends it's those sort of like push trails. Yeah, yeah. Tour. Well, mostly tourists. I mean, the the usage switches to it's it's on during the week it's annual members, and on the weekends it's a daily pass purchasers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can you can actually see the data go up and down like that. Yeah. I was just curious as to what your uh, data shows the typical profile of a Divi rider to be and whether you're uh, doing anything to appeal beyond that demographic. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's what, did you say 69% male, 39% female? 35%. Um, yeah. 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 And our actual members are self reported. Based this based on the survey, oh, not right, 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 right. 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 Sorry. So we, yeah, we in fact just today we are um, we recognize that there are kind of the unbanked issue is part of it, but also there are there are communities where we are serving. So we, it, it's a city service, it's a transit system. We're putting stations everywhere um, equally on both the north and south side and the west side. We're growing, we're actually growing in all directions fairly equally this year too, um, but. We are, so we're working on a bunch of different strategies. We're just recently wrapped up a number of meetings with community groups, figuring out partnerships in those communities to actually promote Divi to people who live in Bronzeville or who live in Tilson or who live in other communities where there's good infrastructure, there's good transit, there's Divi, but there's less use than we'd like to see. But we're figuring it out. I was, I was thinking yeah. more uh, specifically in the areas that you're already in. For instance, I live in Logan Square, and I've encouraged people my age to um, use Divi, and they look and they're like, oh, that's not me. You know? <laughs> so that's what I meant about the appealing beyond that graphic, uh, demographic, because it, it really is. Yeah, I mean, we certainly recognize that it's all about education, and get, you know, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, I. I bike to work on my own bike most every day, not right now because it's too cold, but um, I ride home to, I live in Lincoln Square and I ride home to, with uh, an attorney who also works for the city and I ride home with him probably once, you know, once or twice a month and every time we have this conversation about why he should join Divi and he, he's biking too on his own bike. And he goes to meetings throughout the city and downtown, but I, I still haven't convinced him. So I, re I recognize, and this is me, the manager of Divi trying to at the city, trying to convince someone else who works for the city to do it. So um, it's it's definitely a challenge that we're trying to get around. And Elliot, you can probably talk about this from a marketing perspective too. Yeah, I mean, I guess it depends which you're talking about ethnicity or age or gender. We're all the yeah, we're we're doing. Uh, not so much age, I guess you haven't really thought of that from that lens, but we also did burrito lovers. That's right. Burrito lovers, yeah, the Chipotle. Chipotle, yeah. Oh, deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like for, for the gender thing, and which came up earlier, uh, you know, we'd like to see that more balance. And so we're planning to do Women's Bike Month, which actually doesn't exist, but if he wants to host it, so. Any women or any other people who would like to have ideas about what we can do, like events, um, to get people excited about biking, that's something we plan to do in June. So things like that, um, you know, we can't appeal to everybody, but we're certainly cognizant. Can we just talk about something you said that you want to get on Google so that you people can, you know, plan a trip using your infrastructure as well? Yeah. Um, one of you was like, I would love to be able to use that in my venture card and like that or something like that. Have you guys thought about ideas like that where you have one pass? Yes, we have. And right now, the technology isn't there on the back end, I believe, is the challenge. Um, we, we've talked about that. So right now, all the systems that Alta operates throughout the country don't necessarily work with each other. So we'd like, and part of that is actually technology, but part of it is also revenue sharing. So if I as a Divi member go to DC and want to use Capital Bike Share, even if it did work, who gets the money from when I use Capital Bike Share? So we're working on that as a question, and the, the same question works or comes up with Ventra, but then also the technology is not there yet. That could be crazy data though. We could actually see people moving. Yeah. Oh yeah. Those. No, it would be really great actually. Yeah. 
And it's something long term, it's one of our goals to implement to work with CTA to get Ventra and maybe working together, but it's just not there. Yeah, not too much from like the behavioral decision mm -hmm. making point. Seven dollar a month tag on is just a seventy a year or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a small fraction of the total monthly you know? So it's very easy to just say, Oh yeah, for an extra seven bucks, right. I'd like that option. Right. So it's uh almost eight. Uh, so I think maybe, can you, can you guys stick around for a little bit? Yeah, stick okay. around. Great. We brought free 24-hour passes too if you guys want to come up. Awesome. No, thank you guys very much. Sure.